back up on the website. It doesn't. I'll kind of come back in and. <laughs> hey, good morning, Common Ground Church. Hey, so glad that you guys are with us this morning. Who's excited to be in the house of God? Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Hey, if I have not had the privilege of meeting you yet, my name is Matt McDonald. I'm the lead pastor here at Common Ground Church. If you're with us on site or whether you're with us online, we want to say welcome. Uh, if you're with us online, share that link. A church invite has never been easier than it is right now if you're online. Even if you're in here, go on YouTube, get that link, send it to somebody who needs to hear it. Um, we still believe that our online community is part of our community, um, and we are excited to be together this morning. Um, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is where we're going to be. Uh, as we're saying, we are in week, <clears throat> excuse me, week four now, week four of our summer series, Power Up. Yeah. Say Power Up. Power up. It's been a tremendous series. God has been doing so much in this series, revealing so much to us. We've been talking about how the Holy Spirit is the power up we actually need to live the life that we want to live, that God has called us to live. The Holy Spirit is who empowers us to actually do that. We've been addressing a lot of misconceptions about the Holy Spirit, demystifying, if you will, the person of the Holy Spirit, not the voodoo magic of the Spirit of God. Right, we've, been, we've been addressing some misconceptions. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is for our benefit. It's not here to just disrupt us to the point of we're just so uncomfortable that we're worried that we're opening ourselves up to some kind of black magic. The Holy Spirit is for our benefit. It is the Spirit of God that is at work in our lives. And he's not weird. He's not weird. We talked about it, right? We're weird. The Holy Spirit's not weird. <laughs> And the thing is, is once we all realize, we've been saying this the whole series, once you realize how vital, how absolutely vital the Holy Spirit is in your life, it's no wonder why Satan has done such a, a tremendous work in doing his best to try to distort and confuse the truth around the person of the Holy Spirit. So we're normalizing the Holy Spirit. We're nor not making him come into where he's like on our level, but making it normal in the church for us to have an active relationship with the Holy Spirit. So we talked about first week, remember we talked about who the Holy Spirit is, All right? He's God, he is a person, not an it, not a thing, not this weird mystical being. He is a person to have relationship with. He's a presence, he's not a presence to be feared, right? He's a person to be known. Two weeks ago, we talked about the three different baptisms, right? The baptism of the Holy Spirit, when you surrender your life to Jesus and you become a born-again Christian believer following Jesus, that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit, baptizing you into the kingdom and the family of God. And then we talked about water baptism, which we're doing between services here this morning. We talked about water baptism and how that is a step of faith. It is, it is an outward expression of an inward decision, of an inward faith, and we get baptized because Jesus was baptized, and the Bible says, hey, when you're saved, we want this to symbolize the old you dying, the new you coming to life. There's nothing special in the water, despite what Carrie Underwood said. <laughs> there was not something in the water. <laughs> There's something at work in you. Yeah. It's the Spirit of God at work in you, and this is a representation and a celebration of our faith. And then we talked about the baptism in the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit then comes upon you and enables you and empowers you to do the work that God has called you to do. And last week on Father's Day, we talked about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We, we did a really pulled back view of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I just want to remind us that it is the Holy Spirit. He empowers us. He doesn't overpower us. That is probably the biggest misconception about the Holy Spirit is that he does it without your permission and, and he comes upon you and just, and then something twists and then we just start convulsing and we start, no, 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 the Holy Spirit empowers you. He does not overpower you. And all manifestations, all gifts of the Holy Spirit are to glorify Jesus, not you and me. Not to say, hey, look at this church. Check out what they're doing. Look at what that's, this person. Oh my gosh, they have this. No, no, it's all pointing toward and glorifying Jesus. And we quickly defined, there were nine gifts in that passage that we read last week. Uh, we quickly defined those. I want to encourage you, if you haven't listened to those, 
Or if you're like me, you listen to them and you need to listen to them again, and I need to listen to them again, and I preached them. Go back and listen to them. There's so much there. And today, I am so excited about today. I am so excited about today. We're going to be taking a deeper dive into something that really, about the Holy Spirit, that has the most controversy around it. And I love a good controversial topic from Scripture because it's not me that has to prove it to you, it's God. And he's pretty good at that. But something that has perhaps the most controversy around it regarding the Holy Spirit, likely because there's been a lot of confusion, a lot of misunderstanding surrounding it. Tongues. Now, I don't know where you're at in that, with, in your life, in your walk with the Lord, if you're like, okay, come on, bring it. Bring it. Or if you're like, okay, let's see what he says about this. Let's see what he says about this. Okay. <laughs> Wherever you're at, I want to encourage you. Lean into and embrace the truth of God this morning. Don't let me convince you because it's not me trying to convince you. It is embrace and lean into the truth of God and what his word and what his Holy Spirit is revealing to you this morning. Because remember, the Holy Spirit is for our benefit. Everything he has for us, therefore, is for our benefit. So 1 Corinthians chapter 14 is where we're going to be. We're going to jump around a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I'm aware, I'm going to be, try to be extra aware of time this morning because we've got some baptisms to get to. Um, so I want to encourage you, go and dig into this chapter in Scripture <clears throat> throughout the week. So 1 Corinthians 14, starting in verse 1, says this. I love how Paul starts it. We briefly talked about it last week. Let love be your highest goal. Love, not showmanship. <laughs> not braggadocious faith of, look how long I've been following Jesus. Look what I can do. <laughs> But let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. For, and now I know what you're thinking. I thought it was tongues. Why are we talking about prophecy? Because we're going to see how these two are kind of intertwined and how Paul uses them and look at the context in just a minute. Verse 2, for if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to who? God. To God since people won't be able to understand you. You will be speaking by the power of the Spirit, but it will all be mysterious. But one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened, say it with me, personally. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally, but one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. Then this is Paul. I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you could all prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues, unless someone interprets what you're saying so that the whole church will be strengthened. So here, seemingly on the surface, we have prophecy and tongues pitted against each other, right? Especially in our human Americanized mind, we can't hear two things without picking one. Yeah. <laughs> nope, that one's better. That one sucks. I hate it. it is the, that's actually the worst thing I've ever seen. I know we have a tendency to do that, but track with us this morning, okay? Jump down to verse 14. Paul says, for if I pray in tongues, notice the switch. Speak in tongues, pray in tongues. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. Well then, what should I do? I'll just not pray in tongues ever. I just, I'll just stay away from that gift because it's weird and I can't understand it. I don't know about you, but that's not what my Bible says. <laughs> he says, well, then what should I do? I will pray in the Spirit, and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit, and I will also sing in words I understand. For if you praise God only in the Spirit, how can those who don't understand you praise God along with you? How can they join you in giving thanks when they don't understand what you're saying? You will be giving thanks very well, but it won't strengthen the people who hear you. And then this is Paul. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than any of you. Classic Paul. <clears throat> I'm so much better than all of you. Here's why. <laughs> you know what's funny, though, is, like, again, we sometimes read things not as they are, but as we are. Right? So we read that, and we think Paul's just sitting there being braggadocious. 
Paul is simply just stating facts, and God is the one that picked him to write a majority of the New Testament. So he's simply just giving us some truth, saying, hey, I thank God I speak in tongues more than any of you, but in a church meeting, I would rather speak five understandable words to help others than 10,000 words in an unknown language. Dear brothers and sisters, here we go. Don't be childish in your understanding of these things. Be innocent as babies when it comes to evil, but be mature in understanding matters of these kind. I want to speak for the next few moments a message this morning that I'm calling tongue tied. Would you guys pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your goodness, for your faithfulness. God, we acknowledge, we are aware that you are a giver of good gifts. You were before all things. You created all things, Father, including us. You know what's best for us in our lives. So we bow down in submission to the majesty and the glory and the wonder of you, Father. We ask you this morning to open our hearts, open our minds, remove anything that might be keeping us from experiencing something that is from you for us, simply because we don't want to, or because we're uncomfortable, or because we don't understand it enough. God, any preconceived notions anything. Holy Spirit, we give you the place this morning. Speak to us. Reveal yourself to us. Be at work in all of us. God, I pray that you anoint my lips, my, my mind, my heart to speak your truth and love, God, not my opinions, but your truth, Father. We give you all glory, all honor. Holy Spirit, speak to us this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give God some praise in this place this morning, huh? <clears throat> So tongue-tied, have you ever been tongue-tied? Metaphorically, maybe physically, there's been some, like, kids sometimes are born, have you ever been tongue-tied? I was gonna call it cat got your tongue, but I'm like, no, I don't like cats. <laughs> <laughs> and so tongue-tied, I wanna put the definition of tongue-tied up here. This is from uh, the dictionary. Um, and so tongue-tied means a few different things. One, it's unable or disinclined to speak freely. And in parentheses, I love that, as from shyness. So like, eh, um. So you're either unable or you're just disinclined, meaning you can't or you simply don't want to. For, maybe you're shy, maybe you're stubborn. I think sometimes our, we're not shy, we're just stubborn. Nope, can't make me, don't wanna. You're right, nobody can make you do anything. Congratulations, you rule the universe. <laughs> <clears throat> And so that's the first definition of tongue-tied, is unable or disinclined to speak freely, or two, affected with tongue-tied. We have four kids, two of them, when they were babies, they had a tongue-tie. The doctors had to go in there and clip, right? Yeah, I don't know if you've ever had, heard of that. Like, it's not pleasant. It's not so much, but there's, there's a lot of thought behind that eventually down the road could affect their speech, could affect their ability to eat, and all kinds of different things, so it's best to clip it. Now, there's a bunch of different schools of thought that I found, too, why the tongue tie happens. Um, one of those schools of thought is that it's genetic. It's passed down. I don't know how much truth there is to that. I didn't call them Mayo Clinic. I didn't call anybody else. This was Google, folks. Um, that I found all this research on, and my wife, and having four kids and talking to all the people during that. So th there is a school of thought that believes that it is genetic. What does that mean? It means it's passed down from one generation to the next. Can we put those definitions back up real quick? It's passed from one generation to the next. So it's interesting, you could be affected with tongue tie. When, when we kind of parallel this in terms of what we're talking about in the spiritual matters, when it comes to speaking, praying in tongues. Generationally, a lot of us, a lot of things are passed down to us generationally in terms of what we believe. What we were brought up to believe. Where did you get that from? Well, that's how I was raised. How, and it's not, no disrespect to parents, but sometimes things we believe are simply because they were there. It's like the story with the ham that doesn't fit in the pan. You know what I'm talking about? Like the ham didn't fit in the pan, and so the, the little girl asked her mom, like, hey, mom, why did the, 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 the ends of this ham are cut off to go in this pan? Why is it like that? She's like, I don't know. Ask your grandmother. She used to do it. So she went to hers. It's like, why are the ends of this ham cut off in this pan as we're getting ready? I don't know. My mom used to do it. Go ask her. So she went to ask great grandma, hey, why are the ends cut off in this pan? Is there some sort of trick that makes it extra juicy and moist and delicious? She's like, no, the pan I had growing up, it wouldn't fit in it. So I just cut it off. <laughs> 
And so some things are just accepted generation to generation to generation. They may not be hurtful, but they're simply just there as a matter of, well, that's the way it is. That's what we, so I don't know which background you grew up with, anything like that, but it's an interesting how that can affect our inability or our unwillingness to speak, to embrace a truth that God has for us. So whether you have a misconception or a fear about speaking or praying in tongues, or whether you're simply just shy, uncertain, or unwilling of how to do it, when to do it, or even if you want to do it, I really want to encourage you this morning, lean in as we take a look at one of the most beneficial things that the Holy Spirit offers us as we seek God. Because I'm with Paul this morning. I wish you all, I wish we all would speak, would pray in tongues. Now, I didn't get any amens on that except for Justin. Thank you, Justin. Because I know what you're thinking. You're like, he's going to do it, isn't he? Is he going to do it right now? Is he going to do it in the middle of the service? Is he going to is he going to do it when we least expect it? Don't worry. We're not here for a show. <laughs> this is not how the gift ought to be used. We're going to take a look at that in a moment, which is one of the reasons for the big misconceptions about it. So don't worry. I'm not going to scare you with tongues. I'm not going to just all of a sudden <laughs> But I want to encourage you this morning, don't let preconceived notions, bad experience, get in the way of experiencing a truth and a beautiful gift from our Heavenly Father. So let's start. Let's talk about this controversy, this confusion for just a moment, because one of the biggest reasons for the controversy, for the confusion, confusion surrounding tongues is that a lot of people don't take the time to realize that Paul distinguishes between two things, speaking in tongues and praying in tongues. There's speaking in tongues, and there's praying in tongues. So right here, we got, I'm going to write nice and big so you can see. We got speaking in tongues, and over here we got praying in tongues. And there's a whole bunch of different ways. Excuse my handwriting. It's not the best. I skipped cursive day in class. There's, there's speaking in tongues. Robert Morris, in his book, The God I Never Knew, puts it this way. The public gift and the private grace. The public gift, speaking in tongues the public gift, and the private grace. And so the interesting thing here, though, is that we sometimes get so caught up in making sure we're correctly labeling and identifying, right? Speaking in tongues is the gift of tongues. We talked about this last week when we talked about the spiritual gifts that Paul was listing off. The gift of tongues, the gift of unknown languages, the public gift, unknown languages languages. And then we have praying. We have the private grace. We have, we call it prayer language sometimes, right? Prayer language, praying in the spirit. And so again, us as people, we're really good when two things come up, we like to pick sides. We're side choosers. We can't help it sometimes, right? But the, the, the gift of speaking in tongues always requires interpretation, right? Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Praying in tongues, the private grace, the prayer language, the praying in the spirit, that is unique to every believer as they pray to God. Now, here's the thing when we're reading this scripture in 1 Corinthians 14, we have to look at the context when Paul is speaking. Context is huge, yeah. right? Because the Bible was not written to us. It was written for us, but it was written to the people it was, it was written to, wrote it to, write it to, uh, wrote it the Bible. It wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. So this letter was written to the believers in Corinth, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. But it was for us because the word of God is infallible, proves a test of time, it's authoritative, it's all of these things still for us. But we have to look at context, and we must look deeper and study, say study, Study instead of just taking what's being said on the surface level. Because if we read the Bible in our English translation of the Bible, it's super easy to take everything at surface level. That's why people think the Bible contradicts itself. Why? Because we do it for them. Yeah. We look at what the word says in our translation. It says, wait a second. Proverbs says, don't answer a fool according to its folly. The very next verse, it says, answer a fool according to its folly. What's the deal, Solomon? Solomon. What's going on? We look here at Paul and said, hey, yeah, speak in tongues, but don't, don't, don't like be crazy. Don't, don't be, be speaking in tongues. <laughs> it's like, well, wait a minute. 
What, what's going on here? And so we, it's on us, right, to look at context and study. But when we just take it on the surface level, we get ourselves into trouble. That's how we get into trouble in a whole lot of areas too, not just this one, with the way we dress, tattoos, drinking, women in ministry. We can point to some scripture that says, hey, women should not speak you sh in church. But if we go around the room and say, hey, do we really think women aren't allowed to talk in church? No, no, we don't, why? Because we study and look into it. Now that's a different message for a different time, which I'm probably gonna preach on because I would love to get into that topic and, and let the word of God correct some dumb thinking. <laughs> But the problem is, is when we look at things just on the surface, what, what usually is the indication of that is where we already know what we're looking for. Yeah. And we're just going for proof yeah. instead of digging deeper and letting the word of God get this correct us. We can often get caught up in the distinction and in trying to identify the distinction, right? Because right, I pray in tongues, just so you know, everybody, just to let you know, I, I do that. And so sometimes we're like, if you hear it, if you over, you're like, wait, are they speaking? Are they praying? Because you're only supposed to pray, Matt, private grace, I can hear you, shh. <laughs> private, shut it, just speak in tongues lower. <laughs> Wait a second, he said speak in tongues, he said pray in tongues. So we get so caught up in, in correctly saying the right words that we miss the context. And, and we let the things that, that Paul, in, in th by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is trying to get us and help us. Like, hmm, are they speaking in tongues or praying in tongues? Because I don't know whether to be mad or rejoice with them. <laughs> Wait, Paul said speak when it came like he, it looks like he meant to say pray in tongues. Let's just stay away from it altogether because it's not super clear. It's not super easy to understand or clear, so you know what, I'm just not gonna stay away from it. You know what you will also stay away from if that's the line of thinking we're going with? Wisdom. Because scripture says to search for wisdom like you're searching for what? Silver and gold. You ever just find some gold laying around? Oh look, gold, got it. Sweet, I'm a millionaire. Oh look at all this wisdom. When's the last time you read your Bible? <laughs> I didn't even tell you. <laughs> but I just stumbled upon all this wisdom. <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> because we are supposed to seek and study and go into it. It's not a very helpful or wise thing to get caught up in. And we're gonna take, it's, it's important to take a look at this distinction more, but make sure we're not drawing lines in the sand. There is a distinction, there is a difference, but don't get caught up in drawing a line in the sand to saying, I'm on this side, I'm on that side. You're doing that, not this. Pretty sure we need the elders in here to correct this person. What is, the, what they, I heard them. I heard you praying. I remember the first time I heard somebody praying in tongues. Like, I grew up very uh, conservative, I'll say. I don't wanna make it seem like I'm bagging on any denominations, because I don't, and I don't believe we should be doing that. I also don't think we should let denominations define what we believe. We should let the word of God define what we believe. Um, so I grew up very conservative, so the first time I remember hearing pray, somebody pray in tongues, I was like, okay, yes, God. And then I heard this little, oh, wait a second, I'm supposed to close my eyes when I pray. What is wrong with them? And it took me out of that. Like, I wasn't praying anymore. I was listening. I, was, I wasn't listening to like, yes, Lord. I was listening for like, whoa. It's like foam gonna start coming out of their mouth. Is, is, this, is, is it like a snake charmer? What is, what is gonna happen next? I would, because I, I had no experience with that. I was uncomfortable. But I had a choice in that moment to either let my discomfort, just out of my own discomfort, because here's the thing, if somebody would have came to me in that moment and said, oh, did that bother you? Why? Oh, uh, it's, it's weird, man. Look at this guy. <laughs> I had no scriptural backing. And so I had a choice in that moment to either let my discomfort drive me from something that I just didn't know about and I couldn't control, or let my discomfort drive me to the word and the person of the Holy Spirit to bring me some clarification. I thank God that I took that road, finally. A bunch of times I took that road <laughs> and just left. You know when things get uncomfortable, you don't want them to do with you, you just disappear. Yeah. Don't call anybody, oh, you've just been busy. You work, it's just crazy. Life, it's just crazy. But really, you're like, yeah, COVID, kids. 
It's just, oh, you know, but deep down you're like, mm -mm, it was that tongue talking brother that got me. But you're not going to say that. Why? Because you have no grounds to defend it. You're just uncomfortable with it. And so we're going to keep looking at this distinction. The context that is important to get right here is that Paul is giving instructions on public gatherings. 1 Corinthians is chapter 14. He's giving direction on public. Say public. public. That's this type of gathering, public gathering. <clears throat> Why? Because the people in Corinth were turned in the wrong direction. <laughs> they, were, they got a little out of hand, let's say, the least, when it came to tongues. They, they thought tongues was the mark of spiritual maturity that elevated them over all the other heathens and peasants of the day. We speak in tongues, you don't? Sorry, can't come in. And they were so much so that that was dominating their public gatherings. Everybody's speaking in tongues. That's why Paul's saying stuff like, no one can understand you anyways. How about some English? They probably didn't speak English, but you know, like, you, just, you know what I'm talking about. How about the language that people understand? How about, how, how about you stop focusing on this gift and exploiting that to be the most important thing? Focus on God, on Jesus, on the Holy Spirit, and let him direct how you use these gifts. This is important context to get here as far as who is Paul is writing to. That's why he says, you know what? Focus on prophecy because you're getting out of hands with the tongues. Focus on prophecy, but still seek tongues. But focus on, why? Because this lifts up the whole church. This builds you up. So when you're together, on focus on this. And there's a lot of misconception even around prophecy, like it's future telling. It's simply declaring the goodness, the truth, and the promises of God. Sometimes it's real specific. <laughs> but it's declaring who God is. Verse five, right, Paul says, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but even more, I wish you could all prophesy. It seems a lot of us wish that it read, I wish you could all speak in tongues, but instead I wish you would prophesy. Why? Because we usually use that as a reason to throw out tongues, because see, Paul said it. Yeah, Paul said, I wish you could, but even more, I want you to seek this, not instead of, but forget that, and see, no, he says, but even more. It seems a lot that we would wish, ah, oh, can't, why does it gotta be that one? Can we just throw that one out and be all good? You ever realize that, like at work, maybe you have this coworker, you have this boss, and you're like, man, everything would be great if they weren't here. Now, just get rid of them, we'd be fine. And then you do, and then you find a problem with someone else. Yeah, man, I love this church, but they, uh, that freaking tongue thing, why do they keep talking about it? Why do they keep talking about money? You know what, let's go to this church because they do the things I like. And then you're there and what ends up happening after a couple months? You find something you don't like about them too. But the problem is, is everywhere you go, if it starts to smell bad, I mean, it might not be the place you're going. You might want to like, do I got something on my shoe? Is one <laughs> seems to be the common denominator. <laughs> But we don't, we don't want to look at that. So when we're talking about, yes, Paul says prophecy is more important than tongues in the context especially of public gatherings, but he does not say, so forget about tongues. He says this is how you should gather publicly. Because here's the thing, I truly do believe that the moment we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we are all graced with a heavenly prayer language. I do. Whether we activate that or not is a different story. And I'll get to this more in a second. It's not proof that you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's, that's another misconception that we'll address. Whether we ever activate that or use it is a different story, but we all get it. We all get the potential. We all get it. And here's the problems that have arisen in the past. I'm not going to go into a whole lot of church history, but I'm going to go into it a little bit. Um, the, years ago, early 1900s, 1904, uh, I believe it was, there was an amazing revival in the great nation of Wales <laughs> called, fittingly, the Welsh Revival, where lukewarm Christians, lip service Christians, 
People that, yeah, I know, I, I go to church, I was raised in church, we go to church, it's a nice thing. Lukewarm, lip service Christians were all of a sudden set on fire for God. And this zeal and this passion and this love and this mission began to take center stage, whereas it was just kind of, meh, this is what we do. And this, this spirit of revival swept across the Atlantic, made its way all the way into the States, all the way into Los Angeles, and then there's something, maybe you've heard of it, it's called the Azusa Street Revival in the early 1900s took place. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit was amazing. It was beautiful. God's people being empowered and baptized in the Holy Spirit to begin to go forth and accomplish the mission and the will that God had for their lives. Unbelievable. Now, what happens when something unbelievable happens? It's awesome for a minute, right? And then what happens? We do it with athletes all the time. We root for them, and then they achieve stardom, but then it's like, okay, you, you've had enough. Time to come back down on earth. <laughs> and so what do we start doing? We start picking at all the bad things and negative things and anything we can find. And so what happened in this revival that started in Wales and the Welsh revival made its way all the way into the States and these, this spirit of revival was sweeping the nation and the Azusa Street, oh, amazing. But then it led to criticism. Criticism of the expression of the Holy Spirit. Criticism of tongues, ostracizing people for speaking and praying in tongues. And then it led to offense. Those that were being criticized, like, wait a second, we're... It's amazing that something powerful from God was now all of a sudden at risk of becoming simply lifeless religion. Why? Because people couldn't handle something that they didn't understand and couldn't control. So what that, what that offense led to, the, the people that were then being ostracized for operating in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, mainly speaking and praying in tongues, they began to be ostracized, so they're like, well, fine, you're gonna ostracize us? That led to this school of thought and, and almost doctrine of faith that said, you know what? The proof that you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit is going to be the evidence of speaking in tongues. Denominations were born. Assemblies of God was born out of the Azusa Street Revival. So it became this doctrine of faith that, okay, fine, you're going to ostracize us. And obviously I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing and simplifying something that is amazing to look into. But it led to this school of thought, okay, fine, they're going to make fun of us for it. They're going to ostracize us for it. They're going to kick us out for it. We're going to do it right back to them. You can't be a part of us then if you don't speak in tongues. Well, good, we don't want to because you're a bunch of weirdos anyways. And it began this back and forth, and that's where this, I don't know if you've ever heard this phrase, the initial evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is tongues. Or the initial physical evidence of the baptism in the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. There's one issue with that, though. When we look at the Bible, we've got to look at all of it. <laughs> we can't just look at the parts that back up our claims. And while there's plenty of instances in Scripture of the Holy Spirit falling on people and people speaking in tongues, it's not always the case. Some people begin to prophesy. Some people, you can't always see a manifestation, so to speak, of a gift happening on the inside of somebody. So the gift of speaking or praying in tongues is not initial evidence, but hear me, it is tremendous benefit to the believer and to the church. We have to be intentional to not abuse it, or neglect it simply because we can't comprehend it, right? There's this idea of a prayer language, a prayer language. That's praying in the spirit. That's praying in tongues. And then there's the, the gift of speaking in tongues. Nice circle. Hey, no, nice. There, there's a different, the, this prayer language, it spiritually strengthens the individual believer. The gift of speaking in tongues strengthens the entire church, which is why it requires an interpretation. Yeah. Why along with it, the Holy Spirit will give interpretation. So I wanna take the last moments we have and really dig in on this idea of praying in the Spirit. You guys good with that? Yeah. Didn't know I could do that, huh? So praying in the, here's some things we know about praying in the Spirit, using our prayer language. One, you're speaking to God, not to people. We see that in verse 2, we see it in verse 14, we see it in verse 16, we see it all throughout this passage in Corinthians, that you're praying to God, not to people. And as people, we are made up of three things, body, soul, spirit, right? 
You got a body? Yeah. Okay, okay, just making sure. Let's draw big circles. We got a body. Oh, that's a P. You got a Bopi? Everybody got a Bopi? <laughs> you got a soul. Despite what some people say about people with red hair and their exes, everybody has a soul. Okay, so let's not get into that. And we have a spirit. You ever hear that phrase or terminology, your, your spirit man? No? All right, cool. Um, you <laughs> your spirit. We are body, we are soul, we are spirit. And here's the thing. We are called by God, those of us that have come to faith in Christ Jesus, to glorify God with all three. With our body, right? Romans 12.1. Romans 12.1 said, Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, a holy and living sacrifice. That means you honor and glorify God with your body. We don't treat it as simply just a suit that we get rid of when we go to heaven. We are still called by God to honor and worship God with our bodies, not treat it like a temporary shell. We're called by God to glorify him with our soul, right? It, it says that in 1 Corinthians, in what we were talking about in this scripture. Paul says, I pray to God, because what is your soul? Your mind, your will, your emotions. That's what your soul is. So when we're praying to God, we, we worship God with our soul all the time. We honor him, we glorify him with our soul all the time. Why? Because we pray in a language that we understand. Heavenly Father, thank you for this food. Thank you, it's so delicious. I know it's terrible for me, but please bless it to my body. <laughs> do your work, God, do the miracle. Do it again. Bless this pizza. Bless these donuts in Jesus' name. <laughs> Lord, multiply my sleeps and cut my calories in half in Jesus' name. <laughs> so we, we and, and here's the thing, when it comes to our spirit, I don't know if it's whether a misconception that because we're born again, we're going to heaven. Okay, cool, we're honoring God with our spirit that one time we made the decision to follow Jesus. Or if it's because we don't know how to honor and glorify God with our spirit. But you know what? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, in the verses we're reading, in verses 15, what is it? I will pray in the Spirit. I will pray in words I can understand. I will pray from my soul with words I can understand, and I will pray from my spirit with words that I can't understand. Now, God is not going to ask us to do something that we are incapable of doing. But he's not gonna force something upon us either. Remember, we're not robots, we're not cogs, we're human beings. We have the ability, unlike most anything that was ever created, to choose. So we are called body, soul, and spirit to glorify God. And, and here's the thing, what praying in the spirit does, it builds you up. Verses two through four, if we go back through that, we see that Paul says you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit. A person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. So whether it's speaking in tongues or praying in tongues, speaking in tongues, yes, does edify the church. It also edifies the believer. Praying in tongues, we've somehow pitted praying in tongues and speaking in tongues against each other, right? And when it's this or that, one or the other, you're almost forced to take sides, and then what happens? You end up tearing one down just so you can lift one up. It's how we talk about most issues. <laughs> right, look at the Michael Jordan versus LeBron James debate. You, you can't talk about one, just that. Oh, this is why Michael Jordan's the best, da 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 da. It inevitably goes to, yeah, and LeBron, terrible. Just terrible. Terrible for the game, he's a whiner does all these. Or if you're on the LeBron, you, know, you just got to tear, tear Michael Jordan down. Oh, whatever. He didn't do this. Lost in the first round. And it's like, you know what? That's the two probably greatest basketball players ever to live. We do it in politics, right? Have you ever seen a clean campaign run? <laughs> this is why you should vote for me. If that was all that was in the speech, it'd be pretty short debates. But it's no, it's this is why you should vote for me, and that's why that person is the devil. And you shouldn't vote for them. 
It's always, we, ha- we can't fall into this. What ends up happening is we end up vilifying the idea of strengthening yourself up because if you're doing that, you must be against strengthening the church. Why? Because speaking in tongues edifies the church. Prophecy edifies the church. So why am I gonna do this other thing that only edifies me? Oh, you got all the strength you need, huh? All good? You're just a martyr for the rest of us, only seeking what will build up the church. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. It, it, we pit these things against each other, and it is ridiculous how so many of us buy into this notion that it's one or the other. Praying in the Spirit builds you up, and you know what else we see? It fills out the armor of God. Yes. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, I'm not gonna read all of it for time's sake, but Paul is imploring us, put on God's armor. In verse 13, he gets to saying, put on every piece of God's armor. The belt of truth, the body armor, the breastplate of righteousness is what that is. Shoes put on the peace that comes from the gospel, the shield of faith, the salvation helmet, and the sword of the spirit, and let's go. It's like we stop reading right there. Why? Because it's true. That is all the armor that they identify. But then once you're suited up, what do you do? Then what? Well, we got to keep reading. We got to keep going. In verse 18, it says, pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion. Stay alert and be persistent in your prayers for all believers everywhere. You know, it's interesting about the passage we read in 1 Corinthians 14, 15, about pray in the Spirit. In this passage here in Ephesians 6, 18, both of them use this term, pray in the Spirit, in the translation that, I've, that I have for us today. It says, pray in the Spirit. <clears throat> there we go, better. Pray in the Spirit. What does that mean? Well, pray, if you look up that word, it's simple. It's talking to God. <clears throat> That's what we do when we pray, right? We're talking to God. And that word spirit, it's pneuma, which means the spirit, the breath, the wind of God. So 1 Corinthians, he's saying, I'm going to pray like this. Can we put Ephesians back up there? In 1 Corinthians, he's saying, I'm going to, <clears throat> next slide, please. I'm going to pray like this, just like he says in verse 18, pray in the spirit. The same terminology he uses in Corinthians, I will pray in the spirit with words I can't understand is what he's saying right here. Pray in the spirit at all times. In Ephesians, he says you need to always be praying like this. Why? So you can stay strong and you can be strong in the Lord. I wonder <clears throat> if there's anywhere else in scripture that this kind of theme keeps repeating itself. Well, good question, because it does. I'm gonna invite the band to come back up. We're getting ready to close here in, in just a moment. So we see this idea, right, in Corinthians. Everybody tracking with me? I know I went super teacher mode. I got the whiteboard and everything, but it's important. That's how important this gift that God wants to bless you with is. In 1 Corinthians, he says, I'm not going to throw this thing out just because the Corinthians got all hot and bothered with it and they went a little too far. What I'm gonna say is like in your public gatherings, focus on this, but still, so what am I gonna do? I'm gonna pray in the spirit still, and I'm going to pray with words I can understand. That fra- it's important to know that that phrase he uses for pray in the spirit with words I can't understand is the same phrase in Ephesians that says pray in the spirit at all times and on every occasion, because it's the same phrase that comes up in the book of Jude, verse 20. He says, but you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith. Get this, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Anyone care to guess the words for pray in spirit here? Same as in 1 Corinthians, same as in Ephesians, same as in Jude. Praying in tongues strengthens and builds up the believer. And it's not just reserved for a few. The gift of speaking in tongues, right? We see the Holy Spirit decides who and when he will bestow these gifts on. The public use of speaking in tongues, that's up to the Holy Spirit who, when, and where he is going to give it. This idea of praying in tongues, praying in the Spirit, our prayer line, it is available to every believer who has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Why? Because the Bible says so. If we can sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, we can say, I pray in tongues, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. 
Why? Because it's in the Bible. It's not just reserved for a few. When I got to this point in my life where I realized like the overwhelming <clears throat> amount of scripture that supports this idea of praying in tongues or praying in the spirit or a prayer language, however you want to say it, I really had to ask myself a serious and tough question as a Christian. If the word of God so clearly says that praying in tongues strengthens me and builds me up, why would I not do it? Or why would I refuse to do it? And the short answer for me for a long time was simple. I was tongue-tied. I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know what to do. It was weird. It was uncomfortable. I was like, nope, not me. Don't speak that language. Pretty sure I'm not going to learn in a moment. Thank you. I was tongue-tied. <laughs> it was either my preconceived notion that was passed down to me of being tongue-tied that was keeping me from doing it, or I was just shy, or I was scared, or I was uncertain, or I was stubborn. Here's what I want to encourage us with as we get ready to close in a moment of prayer. I want to encourage you this morning that praying in the Spirit really is a matter of faith and trust in God. It is not a mark of maturity. It's a matter of faith and trust. No, it's not going to keep you from heaven. It's simply here to build you up and edify you. Take another look at 1 Corinthians 14, 15. And in verse 15, I want you to pay attention to how many times it says, I will. Because Paul says, well, then what should I do? I will pray in the Spirit. I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the Spirit. And I will also sing in words I understand. Why is that important? Because you have to exercise your will and choose, say choose, you have to choose to pray in the Spirit. It's not going to involuntary come out of you while you're in church, so don't worry. If, if any of you have been sitting in here like, is it just going to bubble up and start coming out of me? No. It's not going to involuntarily come out here or while you're at the pickup line in Target. So don't freak out about when and where it might bubble over and, and come forth. You have to choose to do it. Exercise your faith. And you know what? It might sound like very limited gibberish at first. But you know what? So does my two-year-old when he talks. You know what I don't tell him to do? Shut up. No one can understand you. Stop it. Wait, learn how to talk, and then you can talk. No. What do I do? A good father encourages him. Keep talking, buddy. Keep speaking. We'll get it. You'll get it. Keep talking. Keep going. I want to share a letter. Um, you might not be able to read it. <clears throat> That's not important. But this is a, a prayer I wrote to myself. July of 2013, so eight years ago about. It, it's, it's a letter I wrote to myself. I remember this journey I've shared with briefly here before. This journey I began to go on with the Holy Spirit saying, okay, God, if, if, if you have something for me, it has to be good, so get me there. But my mind was just so in my own way. <laughs> It was so in my own way. So I remember for months, I would pray, ask God, Lord, I want to pray in the Spirit. Teach me how. Show me how. Was it all 100% right and, and without fault? No, because I'm not perfect. But I remember going on this messy kind of journey, figuring out, Lord, I just want to do what glorifies you. I want to do what is for my best. So I wrote this letter, and I'll just read it real quickly. It said, my prayer today is that I would gain clarity and vision during Deeper Weekend, which is a weekend of worship in, uh, that we did. That God would move in my life in a way that would reveal to me his will for my personal life and my life in ministry. I'm also praying and earnestly seeking the ability to pray in the spirit, to pray in tongues. I want to know God in a much more intimate way, and I want to become much more sensitive to and aware of the voice of God in my life. I want the Lord to use me however he wants to and help build his kingdom. I don't want these things just to say that I received them. I'm praying against those thoughts. I seek these things because I want to go to the next level with God. I want to get better at whatever he wants me to do or needs me to do. And I don't want to remain stagnant in my walk. I want to keep proceeding forward and I want to know Jesus better than I ever have before. And I also pray that God would begin to work the gift of prophecy in me. I realize today that 
I may have this gift, and I pray that it would begin to manifest itself in my life. In all these things, I pray that glory would be given to God, and that is where my focus would be, on making his name famous and not my own. Now, I still get emotional when I read that because I realized for how long I let my own way of thinking, I let my own stubbornness, my own pride get in the way of fully submitting to God. And you know what happened? It wasn't this big burst strike of lightning or fire that came down and I started praying in tongues. I was right back there in the sound booth. I was leaning on the sound booth. Everybody was walking out and I'm like, God, I know you have this for me. I don't know what to do. And I kind of had to get over the idea of it overtaking me and me choosing by faith to pray out loud what I was hearing. Maybe it, was, maybe it would have been praying in tongues. Maybe it would have been prophesying in that moment. But I was just like, God, this is what's in there. I'm just going to let it out. And I was embarrassed. I was, I'm like, oh, what's this going to be like? And I started praying, and this overwhelming sense of God's love started to trickle down on me. And I just began to pray. And you know, to get like super technical and practical, no one's going to try to coerce you into praying in tongues. So don't worry about it. We're not going to say, here's how it goes, Sean. Shuda, shuda bada, shuda, shuda bada Honda, shuda bada boatai, shuda bada. We're not going to do that because that's not how God works. What I am going to encourage you to do is it often comes very short, limited gibberish, it sounds like, just like a kid trying to learn how to talk. I want to encourage you, let it out. Well, you just said you shouldn't do that in public, Pastor Matt. Quit contradicting yourself. Stop it. It's not about you having figured out God and how it should go. It's about you, us being obedient and trusting by faith that God has something for us. So maybe it's when you get home later today all by yourself because that's how uncertain you are. But I want to encourage you, open your mouth by faith and begin to pray what God is bringing to your mind, what he's bringing to your mind through your spirit. Amen? Let's pray. I want to close this out in prayer. Um, and I just want to give you a moment right there, you and God. Again, no one's going to force you to do anything. God's not going to force you to do anything. But I just want to pray and lead us in a prayer that would have us seek the things of God in our life over just what we're comfortable with. So if you would bow your heads, close your eyes. We're going to end in a moment of prayer here. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your goodness. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, we give you the room. We give you our hearts. We give you our minds. God, right now, I want to just declare on behalf of us as a church, God, we want what you have for us. We want to, by faith, do what you've called us to do. So those, those of us right here that, that maybe we're just, we're uncomfortable, we don't know, God, I just pray that this prayer language, this praying in the spirit would begin to develop inside each and every one of your believers this morning, Father that by faith, whatever it is that is coming to our mind that you are putting there, we believe and we declare that you are a good father who gives good gifts. And by us asking for what you have for us, you're not gonna give us something bad. You're not gonna hoodwink us and give us something else. We're not worried. We don't wanna be worried rather that by opening ourselves up to what your Holy Spirit has for us, that somehow something else is gonna get in there and mess us up. God, we believe that you are a good father who gives good gifts to those who earnestly seek you. So I pray this morning, God, for people to begin to pray out in their prayer language, Father. I want to encourage you this morning as you're there, as you're having a moment with Jesus. Yes, this is, we're talking about the private grace of praying in the spirit, in a public setting so it can seem weird. I want to encourage you this morning, as your pastor, as you feel and as you sense and as you hear those things coming up, begin to open your mouth. It doesn't have to be loud, but just begin to pray out 
what it is God is bringing into your mind through your spirit by way of his Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for moving in your people. God, in, 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 the only, in a way that only you can, in a gentleman, gentlemanly, loving father kind of way, continue to move in your people and encourage your people to, by faith, operate in what you have for them, Father. God, we love you so much. In this place, we give you all glory.